Shall I turn the music on? Sure, sure. Okay. <laughs> Right. So you cut you off in the middle of a phrase. <laughs> um, so that's the, the CD box. Who's looking for that? So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Daiwa Anglo Japanese Foundation. Um, my name is Jason James. I'm the director here. Um, but all I'm doing really is the housekeeping announcements today. Um, so I'll just get those out of the way. Uh, the first one is that if the fire alarm should go off, uh, you're not allowed to use the lift. You have to walk down two flights of stairs to the front door and you should congregate on the park side of the street. And the second thing is please don't leave any valuables in our cloakrooms because nobody is watching them. So if you left a laptop in a bag or something, or indeed a violin uh, in our cloakroom, um, I suggest you um, pop down and, and pick it up now. So as I said, I'm not going to do very much talking this evening because um, We've brought in Mike Spencer to chair this event, and I'm sure he's known to many of you. Um, but Mike himself is a violinist. I don't know if you're, you're able to play at the moment in your slightly reduced circumstances. It's, it's a dangerous business playing the violin. Yes, yeah, <laughs> obviously. Um, but no, Mike was uh, with the London Symphony Orchestra for many years, um, and he subsequently developed his own business, um, Sound Strategies Limited in which he, uh, he advises uh, orchestras, including many Japanese orchestras, uh, on educational outreach, he does workshops, he also does workshops for, um, for companies, and again, he does a lot of that in Japan. Um, and for the last couple of years or so, he's been a visiting professor at Ueno Gakuin, um, which is a uh, music college uh, in Tokyo, which has a little bit of an early music uh, speciality to it. I know a certain amount about it myself, as I'm I'm not quite sure how I should translate it, but I'm a kind of counsellor to Ueno Gakuen myself, so Mike and I are both involved there. Um, but of course, the, our, our main uh, speaker today is Georgie Hatui, uh, from Japan's leading uh, international classical musicians. But I'll leave it to Mike to introduce him. Thank you, Jason. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody, and thank you for coming along. And it's quite an intimate gathering. I don't know if you want to move a little bit further forwards. It's, um, by all means, move forward if you if you feel you don't want to. That's fine too. Can you hear me at the back? Excellent. Uh, well, it's it's a great pleasure to be asked to uh, host this evening's uh, presentation with Joji Hattori. I'd heard about Joji for a long time ago, never actually met him, uh, and quite an illustrious career. He studied in Vienna, um, and in the uh, in 1989. Um, at the third attempt, you won the, met the Menuhin Violin Competition. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> some time ago. Some time ago, but uh, since then, he's now a conductor, he's a music director. Um, he's uh, now very much involved with the Menuhin Competition, both as president and as a jury member. And I just learned downstairs that he's also a, a restaurateur and has one of the best Japanese restaurants in Austria. So that actually feeds in very nicely to this title for the whole of this speech about King of All Trades, it seems to me. And we'll look forward to Georgie San talking a little bit more about these various aspects to your career. So we've got three sections to the conversation tonight, really. I'm going to leave the floor to Georgie San just to talk a little bit more about his relationship with Menuhin and the competition and this other side to his, his career. Maybe talking a little bit about what it's like being a Japanese growing up in the Western musical system, which we're talking about downstairs. Um, we'll then have a conversation between the two of us about things like um, competitions and what their relevance is um, today. You know, the uh, menu of competitions started in 83, I think. That's right. And uh, what's changed over the, over the ensuing sort of 30 years or so? And then we'll just have a general chat about education in general, what it's, music education is about in Japan, what it is here, you know, just have a general view of it and uh, how things are changing there. But Georgia, I'm going to invite you to take the floor and just tell us a little bit about your life as king of all trades. Right. <laughs> well, good evening. Um, this is um, a title uh, which I have decided to use for tonight's talk uh, because there is a direct uh, conversation or link to a conversation I had with the late Lord Menuhin. Um, you all know the saying, uh, jack of all trades. And um, 
I used to be, or I, maybe I still am a jack of all trades. Um, I like many different things, and uh, I feel still quite incapable of concentrating my life onto just one subject or one direction. And uh, there was even one speech where, where Yehudi uh, sort of, in a very nice way, made fun of me, calling me actually jack of all trades. Um, and throughout my um, young student times, I suffered very often by the fact that uh, I felt I had proper talent to become a musician, maybe even a soloist or a conductor or whatever, but uh, not the talent to concentrate enough on one thing or like on practicing very much. And uh, I was always distracted by all the other interests I had in life, you know, whether those have been cooking, but there also I was also interested in other academic areas. I studied social anthropology in Oxford. Uh, I was also always interested in uh, the economy, how the world works, and politics, all sorts of things, and just spending four or five hours every day just practicing an instrument was something I couldn't imagine doing. Um, but then I felt it would be a pity to completely give up the chances of becoming an accomplished musician. Um, so I met many pedagogues at that time and asked, you know, what can I do to change myself? And, and is there some way um, um, I, I can still manage to, to concentrate more? Um, but then there were many teachers who said exactly that's what you have to do and uh, to become a musician you have to sacrifice and in your case the sacrifice must be not spending so much time on other subjects in your life. But contrary to these advices by others, um, Ihudi Menuhin was one of the few people who actually said, well, I don't think you can change your personality, but there is hope. And there's hope by um, uh, actually nurturing all your interests. And maybe, not immediately, but a much later stage in your life, what all the time you spent on other interests could actually come back and, and nurture your musical activities. And uh, so he was quite encouraging. And that's why um, he explained that a jack of all trades, if he worked on every aspect of his life where he's a jack, uh, after some while, maybe he could become a queen of all trades and then a king of all trades, and probably never an ace of all trades, but that would be the goal. Um, and, uh, and now, over 20 years later, uh, I have a very versatile life, I, and I have a successful life as a musician, and I really believe that he was right. And uh, of course, I never had the enormous talent uh, of Yehudi Menuhin himself, but uh, I guess he himself actually spent a lot of time in his life on other items than, or other subjects than music. And uh, at the end of the day, the, the more versatile you are as a human being, you can become maybe a more interesting person to talk to, to listen to. And uh, I think at the end, that could apply to the music as well. It might maybe not quite as technically perfect uh, as those who practice more technically, but uh, the content of your music, the story you, you tell through music could maybe become more interesting. So that, that's the uh, reference. That's the title. Lovely. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, when did you first meet? Um, I first met him when I was only five or six years old because my father had translated uh, one of his books into Japanese and we went to Stad, uh, to his summer festival. And I remember um, he gave us tickets for his concert with Ravi Shankar. At that time he was very much into experimenting with, with uh, crossover music with, with uh, Ravi. And uh, of course, because I was very little, he gave us tickets for the first row, which was very kind. But I remember crying throughout that concert because I hated the smell of the incense. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't stand it. But anyway, uh, so that was my first memory of Yehudi on stage. Uh, but the next day, he played, I think, some Bach uh, concertos, and I loved it. And yeah, and later I met him again when I was 14 at his competition. So did you spend most of your early childhood then in Europe? Yes, I moved to Europe, or my parents moved to Europe when I was eight years old. Mm. 
and ever since I have been based in Europe. So what was it like then in that matter, growing into this classical music tradition, which is Western based, being a Japanese? What sort of experiences did you have? Was it an easy transition? Um, I don't know the English expression. In, in German, we call it Hochbegabung. Uh, I actually had a condition, a psychological condition as a child. Um, I was premature. Uh, and actually, it sounds, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I was too intelligent for my age. And it sounds a bit arrogant to say that, but uh, my, the development of intelligence was very early. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm more intelligent as an adult. Uh, so, uh, luckily now, you know, being 47, I feel very normal and uh, not different to other human beings my age. But uh, at that time, I was actually completely unable to play with children the same age. And I refused. And, and I remember even coming back, back from kindergarten and telling my parents, why are other children so loud? You know, I think for me, when you speak loudly, the only reason is if the person who is listening to you is standing very far away, and that's the only reason to speak more loudly than necessary. And the other children, they yell all the time, and I can't stand it, I don't want to go to school anymore. I was a child like that. So you can imagine whether Japan or in, in Austria, and I was always an outsider and couldn't play with other kids. And in that sense, music was a nice escape. I mean, I could spend my time with my violin. Um, I was pretty good at it, so uh, yeah. Did you find any, well, did you still, at that time, did you have a close connection with Japan? Uh, if you was living in Europe, and I'm thinking in terms of here, did, how did you rationalize those two cultures if you were working in a Western musical tradition? Yes, I, mean, I, lo I loved going to Japan, also for its food and so on. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, my parents, especially my mother, loved Europe, and they decided that it was better for their children to grow up outside Japan, which is not a very natural decision. Uh, and in Austria, I was not particularly happy because uh, at that time, 70s in Austria, uh, there were very few uh, um, Asians, for example, in, in, in the city. And, um, very often when I went to a shop to, to buy something, uh, they would treat me as a sensation, like a talking dog. You know, I mean, like, no, the, 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 the shopkeepers, they would like call each other together and say, like, look at this little boy, and he's, he's Asian, but he can speak German like, like we, you know, like us. And this is really uh, quite annoying, actually. <laughs> and he plays a violin too. Yeah. <laughs> And, and so mm. you went then to formal training in Austria as a musician? Yes. Well, I, I, I did it parallel to normal secondary sure. school education. So sure. um, I, I already entered the Vienna Academy of Music mm. at 14 and studied with then the leader of the Vienna Philharmonic, my teacher. I see. And that brings us very quickly on to you moving towards the competition. What made you enter the competition in the first place? It was my teacher from the Vienna Philharmonic who discovered a uh, brochure of the men in competition and mm -hmm. encouraged me to go. Mm -hmm. what, what were your feelings about entering a competition as a young player at that time? Was it an exciting well, thing? At age 14 problem? I was still premature and therefore I was still an outsider in my school and didn't have so many friends. So I thought it was rather exciting because uh, if you're going to be an outsider, you know, you'd rather be uh, a famous or a successful outsider, you know. Uh, so at least if I can't play with the other kids, I have something else in my mind. Flying, you know, and stay in international hotels to go to a foreign mm. competition. I was quite proud of doing this sort of thing. Mm. But you were quite that persistent age. with it. With, I mean, you came back three times, didn't you? Yes. Which is interesting. Do you find other people in the, who are aspiring soloists doing the same sort of thing, but then they just turn up and play for one? Well, well, actually, that has something to do with um, uh, this particular competition already mm. from day one when we really founded it together with mm. uh, Robert Masters, who uh, was then, I think, the headmaster of his school. Uh, they, they started it as, a, as an educational competition. And although I didn't win, it was very clear that the, the management and the organization was encouraging everyone to try many times. Mm -hmm. We were also um, asked to stay until the end, whether you go, go forward to the next round or not, to listen to the other children, to learn mm -hmm. from each other. Uh, we would do with your master classes, also to people who didn't pass to the next round. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, well, I mean, I always admired Judy very much, and uh, also for the person he was, for the personality he was. And, uh, well, I mean, I was only 14, and the age limit is 21, so mm -hmm. I tried. 
few more times. <laughs> and I mean, the, the competition as well, it, it does have a unique feel about it, doesn't it, in, in comparison with other competitions that there are around? Absolutely, yes, yes. I mean, what would you say is the essence of, of, of this particular competition? What, what makes it so Well, the, key, well the biggest difference is that most competitions, uh, their mission is to help the winner start off an international career. Uh, and in other words, they just are having a competition in order to discover the one big talent, and the others are just uh, actors. And uh, once the competition is finished, uh, they're not interested in anyone else except for the winner or maybe second prize, whatever, the prize winners. Whereas the men in competition, uh, the, the entire purpose of the competition is not uh, to help just the winner, but to help everyone who comes to enter uh, to get to the next step, whatever they're doing. And, uh, and also, I mean, whether somebody becomes first prize or even just a finalist without a prize, uh, we're talking about children in the developing stages. Um, something happens, you know, and the one who wins uh, might lose interest a year later, and the one who didn't win uh, might find a new teacher and suddenly improve technique greatly and then become much better than somebody who just beat him a year, year ago. So uh, it's not, it's not, uh, it's really not about winning. You know, it, it was interesting I, when I was researching mm. that I looked at uh, your, your, the chairman of your jury, Pamela Frank. Yes. And she said this is not so much a competition, it's more of a festival. Yes. Which is a, a, quite an unusual way to look at you. If you look at the, the other competitions around the flesh and the Tchaikovsky and things right. like that, it is quite a different feeling about this, this festival, isn't it? Th those competitions, rather. Yes, it's There's, completely different. Yeah, but of course, it's also the age group. I mean, mm. the other competitions. Very often the age limit is 32, so we're really talking about adults who want to use it to uh, as a stepping stone to a big international career. Sure. It's not that easy anymore because there are too many competitions and too few available stages for soloists. Yeah. Uh, but with, with uh, the men wing competition, um, and actually we welcome here Gordon Beck, our artistic director, uh, <laughs> um, together with, with Gordon, uh, we have introduced the uh, rule that every juror also performs a concert during the competition. Yeah. So uh, we're not only there to judge, but we're sharing the stage with the competitors. We can get just as nervous. It's actually quite nerve-wracking to play in front of the competitors who are judging all day. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, so that, that, that is also a sign, yeah. you know, we're sharing and we're saying we're all colleagues. It's yeah. a community of musicians and we're just there to share experiences. And uh, I think that uh, th this is very, very strongly accepted. And one sees how many applicants there are. You know, but yeah. this concept is, is, yeah. is popular with, with the competition. Mm. And I think it's true to say, isn't it, that this is not just the competition per se. That lies at the core of what's happening. But there are all sorts of other activities going on around this. Yes, right. Good. And it's, it's a very lonely life for a young child to be a soloist. You know, I mean, at least when you are a ballet dancer, you have the whole ballet company around you and all the others every day. Uh, who are also good at dancing or whatever, but uh, in this particular genre of solo playing, uh, very often, you know, a 12-year-old is the best young violinist in his country, and he doesn't have any competition in his own country, and then uh, can't meet other friends who are doing similar things. And then they come, and suddenly we have 44 children uh, from all over the world, and they have a very similar, actually quite strange lives, uh, so even the social aspect of meeting each other can have great benefits for our competitors. But then how, what is that process for, for, for acquiring those 44 young people to come along here? What happens before that? Oh, they have to send in a video uh, audition tape. Video audition tape? Yeah, or tape or a DVD, <laughs> CD or And you have to listen to all of it? No, I don't. No, no. <laughs> I mean, what does it does a panel? Right. And so how many, do you, how many applicants do you get normally? For the competition? I think it was uh, this year we got 308. 308. Yeah. 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 A record number of applications from 42 countries. 42 countries. Mm -hmm. And were there any particular countries that were dominating? Um, a lot from America, Japan, Korea, China. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing which has to be said about the violin is that uh, it's an instrument which requires an early start. Uh, there are other instruments, the horn, or even the cello, you know, you can start as a teenager with 13, 14, even 15, and become world class when you're talented. For opera singers, it's even later. I know opera singers who are extremely successful, they, they never studied music before they were 20. 
But with, with the violin, it's a particular instrument uh, because of the sort of fine motoric, it's called the, the motor of the fingers. You have to start early. Um, therefore, it's, it's true that certain countries, including America or also Russia or, or Asian countries, have more parents who encourage small children to start playing an instrument than, than other, other nations. Having said that, we also had many European participants and, mm. and prize winners. I, I realize that, that you know, 1983 were very young when uh, well, the, the, the competition started, but are you aware of any changes that have been in the competition throughout this 30 year period, whatever it is? Uh, have there been particular things that have changed in response to how things have changed in, in, in education or? Well, the, the rule about every jury member performing a concert uh, didn't exist at the beginning. Oh, right. And uh, we definitely expanded. I mean, mm -hmm. there are so many concerts around it. We also have concerts given by participants who didn't get into the finals. Mm -hmm. Semi finalists going out and doing outreach mm -hmm. concerts and so on. So there are many mm -hmm. developments to, mm -hmm. the, to the basic idea. But the basic idea that it is an educational competition mm -hmm. where every participant uh, should benefit in one form or another yeah. through lessons, through meeting other, so, or even meeting another child and then through that other child, their teacher, you know, who might be very helpful for them. I, mean, I changed teachers after my second competition because I liked someone else's playing at the competition and I said I want to study <laughs> without the teacher of that player. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I mean, this sort of basic, the basic philosophy hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. But what, what are your recruitment criteria? When you when you decide who you're going to have to play in these competitions, what sort of what well, students? Yeah, yeah. Well, just that we have to just be completely uh, fair, and it's only mm. it's, it's not about uh, what their background is or whether they need help. No, but what, what, they as, as players, as players, what are you looking for? Oh, I see. <laughs> this is also, of course, difficult because uh, there are the basic technical abilities on an instrument, and then and then other things such as imagination and. and and musicality. Uh, we try to, from 300, we only need to invite 44. So we, we hope that we, we were able to choose participants who have both. Uh, but of course, not everybody has both at the same degree. And uh, that's, that's always going to be a difficult decision. And that's why I actually, although I do it for this particular competition, because I believe in its philosophy, but in general, I really dislike judging musicians, uh, because it's always about comparing apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. And it's not like sports, you can never measure. Um, and if somebody's less perfect, but more inspiring, I mean, they, they are players sometimes, you know, they, they play wrong notes, and it's not always clean, but, but somehow you, you, you cry. I mean, you feel extreme emotions when they play, you know, and what do you do with these musicians? Do you still give them a prize, even there are others who played much more perfectly, uh, it's very, very difficult. Mm. Yeah. Well, that, that comes out of the expertise of, of the panel. Yes. And and it, it's a subjective thing as well. It's a subjective thing, yeah. And, uh, but then uh, the, the good thing about it is that uh, nowadays careers do not so much depend on, on, uh, on the price. So mm. again, they com come to the competition and uh, if they find, let's say, a conductor who falls in love with, with their playing, they might invite, you know, to that particular player to, to mm -hmm. give lots of concerts with his orchestra or something that might be much more useful for mm -hmm. this person's career than winning the first prize. So mm -hmm. um, it's all relative and I, I really wouldn't give too much importance to who becomes first. Mm -hmm. it's, more, it's an event where they can come and, and they have a chance to perform in, in front of a huge public and if you add the uh, online it's you know our broadcast, web broadcast. Mm -hmm. we, we streamline all rounds. Uh, I mean, they're playing in front of thousands of people, and and that's that that's really inspiring for them that they can practice towards the goal of performing in front of such a large audience. Mm. And that was one of my questions was going to be where to after the composition? Where do people go? But it seems to me that actually you're trying to produce musicians who actually have a much broader view of things. Absolutely, and and uh, although uh, the repertoire uh, is mainly a solo repertoire, we also have some chamber music repertoire in our competition. Mm. And and there's so many possibilities. Uh, uh, again, going back to what I said about uh, jack of all trades, whatever. Uh, I mean, as a musician. There are so many uh, different jobs. I mean, okay, you can become a 
soloists, but there are also members of wonderful orchestras, or leader of a group, members of a quartet, pedagogues, teachers, um, artistic directors of, of, of programs, of festivals. Uh, all these jobs need to be filled by educated musicians. So um, I think according to each person's personality, yeah. uh, they, they can develop. And in order to do so many different other things, uh, it's, it's definitely a wrong idea to just practice yeah. history, yeah. to inspire them so they should read, they should study yeah. history, languages, yeah. cultures. It's, uh, I mean, I've noticed myself very much so, you know, over the past sort of 30 years, uh, how the music industry has changed radically, particularly as the classical music industry. Uh, and we see that, you know, orchestras are folding. There aren't the opportunities for soloists. Uh, there is a, a huge demand on people's leisure time. So that, you know, anybody who is interested in classical music as a performer, you're pitting yourself against sport, you're pitting yourself against the internet, you're all sorts of different things. So um, I'm interested when you, you talk about being a jack of all trades, are we giving our students the right sort of training to actually to be able to cope with this new musical environment in which they're going to have to participate? Because they're going to need a broad set of skills. That is true, yes. Um, I hope that the music education in general, especially for instrumentalists, uh, will broaden up in future. Mm. Um, and it's not only about the aspects of what they need in their profession. Um, there are also other uh, simple things like physiotherapy. Um, I mean, to, to play. I'm oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> To, to play an instrument uh, and practice a lot, you know, it's quite a strain, strain, strainful for the for the body. And uh, but very few uh, music colleges offer physiotherapy to the students. Some have started. Uh, was it a guild hall? I, I thought I had one of them just um, started offering the Alexander technique almost as an obligatory uh, requirement for. And, and that, that's a very good idea. Uh, but but other things, I mean. Not just musical theory. I, I, I could imagine history in general, world history, and so on, yeah. could become a very important part of music education mm -hmm. and languages. I, I spoke uh, in Kyoto last year at the International Symposium for Performance Science, and I was asked to present a paper about the training of, of musicians generally, and and you know, is training fit for purpose now? And it's not just necessarily about learning instruments. And having that very narrow channel, because um, uh, to be able to advocate well, what yes. we're doing, I think we we lose out on the number of advocates, good advocates. You know, you're a very good advocate for what you do and for the music uh, 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 environment as well. But uh, many students who come out aren't particularly good at advocating, and they don't realise that actually also they're going to be required to turn their hands to many more different things, particularly community, as, and you mentioned outreach, all these sorts of things now, which are very much part and parcel for the musician's training, yes. uh, and, and, and vital, really, uh, because these young people are, have to take care of what is this, this art form. Do they have to become good advocates? So I just wonder what your view is of that generally. Do you see that in Japan? Do you see that here? Do you see that in Vienna? What would you see in any of this sort of training? Or are you not connected with any of the training in the same sort of way? Well, I used to teach at the Royal Academy of Music, but at the moment I'm not uh, active mm. in, as, as, a, as a teacher. <laughs> um, having said that, uh, for example, at this particular competition, um, where, which is actually a gathering of, of very uh, one-sided children in a way, you know, that's very good at one instrument. And uh, it will be, I, I try each time to, to talk to as many candidates as possible to encourage them and to explain to them that uh, their career as a musician is not only going to be about being perfect on the instrument, that's only going to be an important but actually small part of, of the whole profession and communication, social skills, uh, also, a certain intellectual understanding of, of, of the meaning of arts or music in society. These are all important things in order to ensure the survival of, of the what you call high culture in, in uh, human society. Um, and um, yes, I think it's incredibly important. Uh, but also, to uh, very often, this nowadays too much emphasis on, on just perfection you know this is a little bit today it's a, it's a one says the age of sports um, people are very keen to get things going perfect you know technically perfect 
but uh, when we are talking about creating technologies and machines, this is important. We want a, a computer, we want a telephone which never breaks and which <laughs> always works perfectly. Whereas uh, with art, uh, the purpose should be about touching and moving people. And that has actually nothing to do with perfection. And, uh, and it's about the story to tell. It's about creativity. It's about inventing, actually, a story to tell to your audience. And uh, before you can invent or create a story to tell, you need to listen to many other stories and then have some kind of life experience, um, either directly or by consuming other art forms and other uh, knowledge, reading, history, and all that sort of thing. Yeah, so I, I really feel that all of that needs to be encouraged much more in, uh, in musical education. But, but I hope it's going in the right direction. And exactly the same with, with uh, in Japan. Uh, whereas, I mean, I wanted to today also spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the relationship mm. in Japan between the society and, and uh, music, or classical music in particular. And uh, one thing which, uh, this is a little bit now coming off the subject of the, of the competition, um, but um, being a Japanese person um, who is performing Western music as a profession, uh, many times I even um, suffered from the fact that there was nothing particularly Japanese about my, my job. And actually, the reason why I started my Japanese restaurant in, in Vienna as a second job, and I take it very seriously, it's not a hobby, you know, because uh, I'm very hands on with the management of that particular restaurant, uh, is that I wanted to spend some time where I can uh, use my Japanese side, my Japanese identity, and also aspects of my own personality, which are Japanese, which is uh, aspects which Western European people don't have, that I can use that as well, or mix it with my knowledge about, uh, about Europe. And that particular restaurant is, is, uh, is a fusion restaurant. Um, and it's also about introducing Japanese beautiful things to, to Europe. Um, but going back to the relationship between Japan and classical music, uh, there's one slight um, problem, or I, I can almost call it a virus, uh, in this relationship, which I would like to uh, mention and make as many people and also young Japanese musicians aware of that they can, they can treat that virus and, and get rid of that virus. And that is the, uh, the fact that um, in history, well, in the 19th century, Japan opened its borders to Western Europe or to, to, to the Western world and saw that the whole world consisted of colonies and the colonizers. Well, it was not very fair, but that was reality. And it was very clear that the Japanese people didn't want to become a colony. So they had to make sure they had enough weapons to defend themselves. But the next uh, thing they, they said is, well, which is also kind of understandable. I mean, if the world consists of only colonizers or colonies, then we're going to be one of the colonizers. That's much better than becoming one of the colonies. So they occupied some neighboring countries like Korea. And then, I mean, this is a little bit very simplified, but when they, they, when, when they were the colonizers in Korea, they had one problem. They, they looked the same as the people they just occupied. No, I mean, Europeans in Asia, Dutch in Malaysia, you know, it's very clear who were the col colonizers and who were the colonized. And in a way to justify occupying people who look the same when they were actually your cousins in the long run, they, they decided to, to really impose Western culture in their own society. So that the difference, the obvious difference was when the Japanese was in Korea, he was dressed dressed in Western clothes, he ate French food, uh, and he was listening to Mozart. I mean, it, and, and there's this aspect of Japanese history. Um, it has nothing to do with how wonderful Mozart is and how universally wonderful Mozart is. And I wish anyone uh, was a chance to, to, to spend time with Mozart, listening to Mozart. So by, by coincidence, it happened to be a very good thing for Japanese society that some wonderful European music got imported. But the initial reason why um, 
let's say the Japanese government even decided to put Western music on the cur curriculum of, of school books and actually reduce the amount of, of uh, curriculum on traditional Japanese arts was in order to justify that politics and have nothing to do with actually the love for, for the arts. And 150 years or even 160 years later, I still feel that there's a little bit of that aspect left over, completely un unaware in most people's psychologies. But uh, I mean, I give another example, it's coffee. Um, when you spend time in Japan, uh, and, and I always never understood that uh, when uh, families offer a drink to, to, let's say, a plumber, you know, who just came to fix something or, uh, or to their cleaning ladies, they always offer them tea, Japanese tea, and never coffee. But, uh, but if you're a VIP guest in, in a company, you know, a client of a bank, or whatever, and then you get in one of these all sets of miles, maybe it's in one of these rooms with a sofa, and they always offer you coffee first. I mean, or if you're an important client. And if you don't want the coffee, then of course they will bring you tea. But coffee is still considered a more prestigious drink, which is completely ridiculous. I mean, green tea is healthier, it's more expensive, actually, right? So they're, they're definitely not saving money on the, on the plumber you know, by giving them green tea. Uh, coffee would be probably cheaper. No, but, but you know, this, this is just one little detail. But and and with that, um, I've, I've observed that uh, there's still Japanese musicians uh, who feel discriminated in Japan uh, because they're Japanese. Um, I mean, there are exceptions. There are wonderful exceptions like Seiji Ozawa, who never had a problem. But uh, unfortunately, it is really true that uh, there is always a certain percentage of Japanese audience, classical music lovers, who only <laughs> go to concerts given by Western orchestras. And I mean, there is, is, I don't know the exact percentage, but if you uh, would go to a concert of the Vienna Philharmonic in Tokyo and uh, ask every audience uh, how many of them have also heard the Japanese orchestra in the past three years, you would be surprised how many would say no. Um, and um, I, I just you know, want to make uh, people aware, and of course, this is not, uh, you, you're not Japanese musicians, uh, but maybe you might talk to some, and you know, this is one aspect I would like them to become aware, and I wish that uh, the Japanese uh, musicians or young artists could become more proud about their own culture, and, and although I said you cannot use japanese in for performing Mozart, but you can always have uh, use cultural pride uh, in anything you do. And uh, for example, if a Japanese music student also has a greater knowledge about Japanese traditional art, and uh, if a Japanese opera singer would spend some time researching kabuki or, uh, or uh, it doesn't need to be even music, I think that uh, that could be even very beneficial for the future of music in Japan. It's interesting to hear observations about that. I know from working with the curriculum in Japan that a lar large part of the music curriculum there is still looking backwards to the 19th century. And you still have these songs by Schubert in there and, and uh, Schumann, which are not appropriate for seven and eight year olds, really, in the same sort of way when there's a lot richer resource, a much wider resource that's available now. Uh, and, and sort of the, the methods of teaching is that I find that, that uh, children now are still going through the same methodologies that their grandparents, if not their great grandparents, were going through. So it's quite interesting what a long tail that has from, from, from the 19th century. And also, um, I think you're right with, you know, that there's very much so that there's uh, the stigma about the fact that you're not, uh, once Japanese musicians, then not a European orchestra. A lot of Japanese musicians, or the first question they say is, well, is this the way they would do it in Berlin? Or is this the way they would do it in London? And you find yourself saying, it doesn't matter what they do. Actually, it's what you do in the end. Because there is such a very strong musical culture now, which is not about copying it. Actually, it's, it's become very Japanese. And uh, some of the best concerts I've been to recently have been in Japan. The Marwa Nine I went to with NHK and the, the contemporary concert. Terrific, terrific concerts. So there's no need to be looking over the shoulder in the same way. Yet, we still get a lot of Japanese students studying abroad. 
Uh, and what's your view on the studying abroad? Is that a good thing to do? You did it yourself. Well, I think for all artists, and especially performing artists who are um, appearing on stage, and especially on stage in different countries, it is important to travel, to, to know other cultures. So it's important for Europeans to know other uh, continents, and it's important for Japanese to know other continents. That doesn't necessarily need to be Europe, it could also be other Asian countries they explore, or they could go to Africa. Um, but just to uh, study other nations and to visit, I think is extremely beneficial to, to anyone. Mm. And as regard to uh, classical music, it is of course logical that if Japanese want to study abroad, uh, then the first choice ends up being Europe, because it was composed here after all, and you can't even go to all the venues or all the houses of these famous composers and so on. And to, to, to uh, experience the atmosphere of Europe. Um, but, um, but I think the, the big issue is not where they study, but they really absorb it uh, as part of their own culture at the end and mm -hmm. combine it with all the knowledge they have about their own culture. And uh, it's like uh, also uh, studying a new language. Um, it's, it's important. First of all, one says one has to always know the, the own language very well, the own language well before one can successfully study a, a second language. And I feel it very similar with, with culture. So you, uh, and then once you, have, you are a very cultured person with, with the Japanese, embed, embedded in Japanese culture, and whatever it is, it doesn't need to be a particular form of art, uh, then you can experience European art and then integrate that with, with the, the rest of your personality and then it really becomes your own. And, uh, and that, that's not as difficult. And um, actually the, the coffee example is also, there's something very stubborn about Japanese people. I mean, the coffee does exist in Japan now since 160 years. Um, and I don't know how many years the Italians have had coffee, but obviously coffee beans do not grow in Italy. So they also <laughs> imported it from either Turkey or or from South America at some point, right? And they think it's a national ring. Or the British with a T, you know? I mean, Darjeeling is not a British... Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not the suburb of, of London. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and it's it's a lane. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, as a matter of fact, green tea was invented in China, not, not in Japan. So, um, I don't know why uh, there's so much reluctance to, mm. to actually make the, the, the former import into really something of their own and sort of connect with their own identity. And that's something I wish, uh, you know, could happen more. And for me, that will be a big challenge for the Japanese future agenda of, of education, how to integrate formally foreign things into Japanese society that Japanese start believing it's not foreign anymore. And mm -hmm. coffee mm -hmm. is a good example. Yes, it is. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. it, it, it's, uh, it, I mean, I, I deal with a number of students in Japan, and, and it, it, it intrigues me the fact that they will come and study the uh, UK and America, and they have the greatest of difficulty fitting in when they get back home. And you think that, you know, studying over here will be a passport to a job, because that's what you come and study for in the end, you have a way to get a living. But very few of them manage to get jobs. And, and I wonder to an extent if it's also the nature of the training they get when they come abroad, because I think that, the, that your conservatoires in America, in Britain, in Germany, they just train for their own particular cultural yeah. relevance. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that these people they are training here then have to go and live in a different, well, return to their own culture yeah. and apply what they've done. And I think that that is a great uh, friction. Yes, friction I agree to the answer. Sort of yeah. But we should see if people would like to ask some questions, questions. actually. We would. It's going to be a nice conversation here, but uh, at the back, I saw a hand go up. Yeah, I'd like to ask, uh, why is it that, uh, why is it that um, there's a presence of a United Biggest by Japanese people towards their own resistance? And the first person in the court, Baker said, well, he asked them to play like this in Berlin, so on and so forth. Why would they not present their own resistance? I mean, resistance and resistance. I will not give them the chance. Well, I, I believe that that is correct, but uh, why are they? Um, well, I, well, I've, I've got my own take on this yes, uh, yes. about it, but it's it's very much it was to 
there in, in the 19th century, there's this sudden influx of Western cultures. And, and that idea about this is where it came from, so it must be right, is still prevalent there. I mean, people will listen to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in Japan, and everybody says, we love Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, it's a great piece of music, but actually, all they're talking about is the tune at the end. <laughs> and it's absolutely true, and I've, I've, I've tested this on the workshops I've run, so tell me two things about Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. First thing is they say, well, it's got this great song at the end, you know, and it's about brotherhood, but they don't know anything else about it, so it's this picking of culture, and not sort of really sort of making it your own, mm, I think, yeah, in some sort of way. And so there's still that looking over the shoulder of what's happening over here. And yet, you know, the, conf the terrific players over there. But I think the psychotic is also the left over from the 350 years of isolation politics. Yeah. Um, that yeah. still, I mean, the Japanese are very good at believing that they themselves can never be good at foreign things. And this is, this is, uh, it's very unproductive now for, for all sorts of things because the world is now growing together and most products, you know, it's not uh, foreign or, or Japanese anymore. Um, one thing maybe which, which is interesting, I mean, I'm sure it's impossible to change that, but uh, the Japanese uh, language um, has always had two ways of writing, the kanji and the hiragana. The kanji uh, were the originally Chinese uh, signs and uh, so the Japanese language is actually a dual language consisting of old Chinese combined with modern Japanese. And, uh, but they have somehow managed to, after over 2,000 years, to believe that uh, the imports from China originally uh, are also their own. So they can identify themselves with, with, uh, with the kanji. But then there's a new form, a uh, new writing called katakana, which was invented in the 19th century in order to write the Western words, uh, Western names, Western words. And uh, well, that's still there. And in fact, you see, I mean, kohi, mm -hmm. coffee is, is written with katakana, and green tea is uh, written with either hiragana or kanji, which means Japanese language. And uh, again, every composer, you know, Mozart, it's written in katakana. So they always, there's always a tendency to believe that, uh, well, if it's music by a katakana composer, it's probably performed better by a katakana musician, you know, which means not Japanese. Um, and uh, getting rid of, of uh, that whole writing system. And most other nations, they don't have that. And, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously, you know, could you imagine if you had to use a special sort of uh, Turkish signs in order to write coffee in Italian, then it's much more likely that for centuries, you know, Italians will always think coffee as a foreign drink. But uh, because it's just the alphabet, it's just 26 alphabets, and everything is written with these 26 letters, uh, a foreign word can very easily, after a short time, be conceived as a non-foreign word. And uh, that doesn't work with Japanese because of this damn katakana. So maybe we should you know, vote for getting rid of katakana. Yeah. Everything in hiragana. <laughs> and there's a very yeah. interesting linguistic thing about it. Mm. You know, that Western style music works with Western style, style languages. You know, we have that heritage in the ancient Greeks and with the Romans. And the rhythmical structures very much associate very strongly with the musical structures that we have, particularly rhythmical structures. And that doesn't happen with Japanese in the same way. It's very interesting. Another question. Anybody? Yeah. In, I, I have a go. I'd like to. Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, I'd, I'd revert to our talk about the competition. Um, and, and from what I've heard, I very much approve of its motivation and your particular view of it but it does have problems because in terms of art we are dealing with quality now i'm personally in favor of musicians doing as you say taking a bigger part in the, in the outside world uh, and we, we have distinguished examples of that. Um, Schweitzer, Casals, mm -hmm. people who were politically interested and anti-colonial in their attitude and propagandists, if you like. But mm -hmm. we, we know that 
in both these cases, there were critics who said that, you know, he has sacrificed the quality of his playing for <laughs> broader causes. Now, this is a problem, isn't it? Uh, I, I, I don't know how to overcome it. I was thinking that I shouldn't do this in her presence, but that, that my wife will very often say, watching the, the proms on television, that if such and such an artist, predominantly a Japanese, uh, predominantly a violinist, mm -hmm. uh, if he would only smile, or if he would only, the quality would greatly improve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm not suggesting that as a criterion of judging quality, but this is a problem. And relate this to Yehudi Menu, because after all, his many outside activities affected his music and playing and performance, did it not? Um, well, first of all, uh, I think this, this is quite individual. It is true that, uh, well, I, I, let's do it by order. First of all, as regards to competitions, uh, I completely agree that the competition remains a problem and a paradox. Uh, because uh, uh, the purpose of, of music has absolutely nothing to do with, with comparing and, and putting people's abilities in order. Um, actually, if it was for me, you know, I would even be, be happy to, to rename the event, you know, and not call it Menuhin competition anymore, but just Menuhin Educational Festival for Young Volunteers or something like that. And, uh, and one should not have first, second, third, and fourth prizes, but we should only have prizes for particular achievements or particular aspects of their personality or playing or, or just for particular pieces uh, that have done extremely well. Whether this, this uh, complete change of identity of an event will not uh, upset too many people involved and also make it even more difficult to, to continue and finance and so on, that I don't know, but, but this is definitely food for thought. And uh, at least my personal opinion is that, uh, yes, I completely agree that it is a, a paradox in itself. The other thing about uh, how wide the activities of a musicians should be or should not be, um, I, I agree, yes, there were many musicians who uh, started spending maybe too much time on things outside music and stopped being quite as good, perfect, uh, committed, whatever, to, to their art as they used to be. Uh, although even that is, is a very subjective uh, feeling. Um, in general, I would think that today, in the 21st century, uh, unfortunately, sort of the aspect to listen to a concert in order to get a spiritual experience or uh, to, to actually with the purpose of going somewhere to get touched, to get moved. Uh, this is unfortunately getting less and less of a motive for the majority of the audiences. Uh, many audiences nowadays go to concerts to get either entertained or even some of them, you know, it's, it's just an social event. Uh, it's just to go and to spend an interesting evening with friends. Um, so uh, in that society, it's even more difficult, I suppose, for, for versatile people to further concentrate, to perfectionize their art. I'm not talking about perfectionizing the technique, but the perfectionizing the commitment to the art to become even the deeper and greater artists uh, they can be. And even if they do, <coughs> there are fewer and fewer people who will appreciate this little difference, which is almost uh, invisible uh, on the surface. Um, yeah, so altogether, uh, as sad as it sounds, um, and although I'm a classical musician myself, um, I must admit that classical music has lost maybe the importance in society it has and I hope it will be at least be replaced by other things which are just equally uh, deep and and, uh, and touching um, yeah so I don't know but but, but about the, the aspects I mean how to widen 
that I think is also at the end of the day um, each individual's personality. And, and I don't think Yehudi could have been stopped from doing all the things he, he did outside uh, practicing oh. himself, the violin or whatever, just because of the way he was. And uh, yes, I, I suppose he, and very often many people say as a violinist, he was at his best when he was under 20 years old. And that probably is true. But, but then he could help the world and other people with, through other means than just playing the violin. So I don't think it was a mistake he did. Well, add just a little mm -hmm. comment to that. Uh, I've lost count of the number of times when I was in the LSO that I was told I wasn't to smile or to look as though I was enjoying myself. <laughs> uh, it was, I found that rather strange, actually. And, and I think we, we've lost touch with the fact that actually, fundamentally, music is a, is a communication tool. Um, and it's an important communication tool, which is why sometimes I have an issue with the competitions that I see, which well, I am very reassured about the menu competition, which has a completely different sort of uh, ethos behind it. Um, anthropologically speaking, music was always a tool for building social relationships. It was. You could go back and look at it. It's just become captured by the record industry and it has become a vehicle for producing money, which has its, its good points and its bad points. But we do seem to have lost that sense of uh, humanity and the fact that we're there to make connection with people. That's why Lord Menuhin was so exceptional, because he did make those connections and he had a wide uh, interest in all sorts of things. And that showed through his music. Contemporary play, Vengerov. Now, Vengerov, I find that same sort of humanity and fun with mm -hmm. people like Vengerov as well. But there are, you know, a lot of players out there who have lost that sense of humanity. And the fact that as musicians, we're there, actually, we're architects of creating these sorts of social relationships, not just between ourselves and the audiences, but between audience members as well. And I think we've lost a lot of that sense. Gosh, that was a deep thought, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Please. Um, um, I just want to ask, since you've mentioned about the Japanese Jews signing here and having difficulty integrating back into their own culture, do you have any word of advice or advice about how to integrate back into Japan? Into their own culture. Um, well, uh, having lived most of my life outside of Japan, um, I don't think I'm the best person to give the right advice how to integrate. Uh, back and my my personal view on that would be to uh, try to make a virtue out of the weakness and the quote um, and um, I hope that the and my feeling is that uh, the Japanese people who are f sort of fifty and younger that generation and um, uh, are much more interested in welcoming back Japanese who have become slightly unconventional from a Japanese perspective. Uh, people who are 60 and over, I would say, forget it. I mean, they're not <laughs> going to accept uh, a returnee from London who has you know, become much freer in their thinking. Uh, they will try to do everything to sabotage your career. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so the next generation. And, and, and there are plenty of people. I mean, I only go once a year, actually, to a conference in Japan, which is uh, uh, it's just 50 people from all kinds of professions gathering, and they have to be between 40 and 50 in age, which means in three years I'll be kicked out of that. <laughs> um, and we have exactly these sort of conversations about uh, yeah, how to open Japanese society and how to make Japan also more competitive, because if they stay the way they are, um, they, it's a nation which produces so many fantastic products still, and uh, uh, so many <laughs> still parts, you know, like uh, technological parts of, of products from other countries are made in Japan with Japanese technology, but uh, they're, uh, they're, they're horrible salesmen when it comes to uh, representing themselves and their own products abroad. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Japan, even from an economical point of view, is in actually quite strong need of people who are able to communicate better with other countries, other nations, and, and you know, both in Asia as well as uh, in the Western countries. So, um, I mean, actually, whatever genre, I mean, I, it will be good if you have a chance to add another continent, whether it's Africa or, or Asia, um, to your repertoire. 
you know, and then when you come back to Japan with an open attitude and say, I'm Japanese, I still love Japan, I want to do something for Japan, and I know how to communicate in England, and I know how to communicate in, I don't know, whatever, in India, in China, um, I think the time will come quite soon that these people will be given important positions in order to help Japan communicate better. And I think I would, I would say there's one thing, don't be afraid to challenge what you've yeah. learned. Actually, uh, and I'll give you an, an example of, of some young women who came across here to study, uh, looking at, uh, they came across here to train in this outreach work and education work, community work. And they went into Hackney and places like that, they learned all these skills. And they went back to uh, Tokyo and uh, Kawasaki and places like that. And they spoke. It doesn't work. We're, we're doing what we did in Hackney and it doesn't seem to work here. Well, of course it doesn't work there because it's completely different. And the people who they're learning from here don't realise it's completely different. And so they're learning this set of skills and not challenging them. And they need to challenge them. So learn over here. But then, you know, it's not a... It, asking questions and challenging is not a very Japanese way of doing things. But uh, when you're dealing with these sorts of... But Western music is really all about questions. Western art forms is all about questions. And if you don't learn that fundamental thing when you're here, then actually you've lost the very essence of it. It's true. You know, so that's all, all what I say to all my, my young people that come back. Why are you doing that? Just, just know, you know, at least not ask it. Any other questions? Please. Do you recall which piece or pieces you used to win the competition in 89? And you got a violin that you could play right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately, I didn't bring my violin here today, but I have brought a recording. Um, I mean, that could be played in. Again, as, as we finish the talk, we will then play it again. Uh, and uh, uh, I won the competition, the finals, with, with a Dvořák violin concerto. And uh, I have a strong affinity, or always had a strong affinity for Dvořák, uh, which actually is one composer where I felt I could use slightly my Japanese mentality, um, much more than Mozart. I mean, there's nothing more un-Japanese than Mozart, in my opinion, <laughs> mentality-wise, you know? Uh, I mean, all of his operas, you know, it's, it's so strong Western kind of emotions, yeah. and this entanglement of these emotions. Um, yeah, so I, I, I love that concerto. And, uh, yeah. Do you, do you play much in the UK? Um, no, unfortunately not. I mean, um, I, I, I sort of split my time at the moment between conducting and, and uh, conducting orchestras and conducting a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and uh, I only give about three to four concerts every year um, on the violin. Uh, but I do play a concert at the Menuhin School as part of the Menuhin competition uh, events uh, on the 12th of April, and unfortunately, unfortunately sold out. Sold out. <laughs> <laughs> so does that mean you're a chef in both places? Chef, chef orchestra, yes. orchestra? Yes, I mean, one is, uh, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. I mean, it, it's inc incredible how similar um, uh, um, sort of managing, or overall managing a restaurant is to, to uh, being in charge, artistic director of an opera production. Extremely similar uh, because you have got different sets of people. You know, I mean, you have got people who cook, who people uh, even in, within the cooks, you have the leading cooks and the young cooks who help, and then people who wash dishes. You have people who clean, you have people who serve, uh, have people who do their uh, buying and uh, buying of the wines. I mean, it's so many different roles, and yet they have to work together and coordinate each other for just one performance every day when the curtain goes up. That is when the opening hour of the uh, restaurant starts, and, um, and it's incredible how different how different the perspectives are of, of these people, depending on what they do on the same thing. And somehow, as the artistic director of the whole thing, you have to coordinate and make sure that everybody respects each other and and, uh, and create this one one final product. Same with opera. <laughs> <laughs> nice I think uh, will we be wandering downstairs? Yeah, yeah you really yeah. think. Um, um, yeah, so I just come and do the honours here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe a little bit more loudly than before, then, for those who want to particularly. Yeah, the audience is the media, I have to stay.